Spirit of the living God fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, free us. Spirit of the living God fall afresh on us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a great cup of coffee, but <clears throat> my throat is still adjusting to um, the colder air that we received yesterday. This is my first time as an official visit to St. Mark's, but it's not my first time at your church or in your sanctuary. And for those who are part of the adult conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, you heard and learned that I was actually here as part of the walkabouts. This was our first stop as we had a chance to worship together before we made our way over 750 miles during that week in North Carolina as part of your discernment process. And I've been back at least once since then for our clericus gathering, but this is my first official visit with you and the opportunity to worship with you. And I'm grateful for this time and grateful for the time with the folks at the adult class just prior to the service. You all don't know me that well yet, so I'm going to begin with a story. I have two daughters, Kate and Lee, and when they were growing up and would get impatient on a long car ride or waiting for an appointment at the doctor's office or at a restaurant waiting for the meal to be served, I would tell them a story. And I would always tell a story about two sisters, Josephine and Genevieve. The stories were formulaic problem would arise, Genevieve would see things one way, and Josephine would see them from another perspective, and it would cause a conflict. And then something would happen, and Josephine would begin to see the situation from Genevieve's perspective, and Genevieve from Josephine's. In the end, it was less about solving the particular problem, and more about coming to see something from someone else's point of view, and that changed the perspective. As an English major in college, I learned about a plot device called Resolution by Reversal, and all of the Josephine and Genevieve stories were resolved by this construct, Resolution by Reversal. Which brings us to this morning's Gospel reading from Luke. To be honest, when I read this passage earlier in the week and began thinking about Luke's version of the Beatitudes, I wanted to open with the line, whoa, 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 whoa. In case you didn't recognize it, and just be grateful I didn't try and sing it, that was the opening of the Burt Backrack Hal David tune, Do You Know the Way to San Jose? It's actually just kind of a visceral reaction to that list of woes we just heard from Lynn in our Gospel reading. Hold on a minute. That's not part of the Beatitudes we've come to know and love. Who added all these woes? And I don't normally title my sermons, but if I did, I might be t tempted to call this sermon the karma of Jesus. We all follow the construct here. It is another example of resolution by reversal. If things are going poorly for you now, all this will be reversed in God's kingdom. It's a hopeful message. But then Jesus starts the second half of the list. If things are going well for you now, this too will be reversed later. It's kind of disconcerting, especially if you happen to be well-off, happy, or well-liked. Karma is generally thought of as a kind of cosmic corrective. If you treat others poorly in this life, you will pay for it in the next. And vice versa, if you treat others well, you will be rewarded. Our contemporary way of summing up the concept of karma is in the phrase, what goes around, comes around. But the formal definition from Hinduism and Buddhism is a bit more complex. Karma is the sum of a person's action in this and previous states of existence, 
and it's viewed as deciding their fate in future existence. We might call this a kind of holy reversal. And that is certainly what we find in Luke's version of the Beatitudes. But there's a crucial difference between the Eastern understanding of karma and what Jesus is actually saying to us and to his disciples. Karma is all about future states of existence. Jesus is actually talking about here and now. Jesus begins his ministry with the bold proclamation that the kingdom of God is at hand. Remember a couple of Sundays ago, his reading in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, where the lesson is from Isaiah, and Jesus concludes by rolling up the scroll and proclaiming to the body gathered, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus isn't talking about some future state of existence where wrongs are redressed and everything is set right. Jesus is talking about today, in this life. Jesus' statement is actually a revolutionary one. And you may remember from two weeks ago how that story turned out. The key question for us this morning is, is this good news? This past week, our church celebrated the 30th anniversary of the consecration of Barbara Harris as a bishop. Barbara was not only the first woman bishop, she was the first African-American woman bishop in this or any other communion. One of the quotations attributed to her early on in her ministry as a bishop was this, love God, love your neighbor, let the revolution begin. At the time, it was deemed too radical, too political. But Barbara was one to speak her mind and her heart. Today, we have our own version of Barbara's message. It sounds like this. Love God, love your neighbor, change the world. It's rooted in that same gospel tradition as Bishop Harris's message. We can trace it right back to our reading from Luke this morning. Jesus' message is one of a radical reversal, of upsetting the status quo. It's consistent with some of his other messages about reversals. You know them. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. That which was old is being made new. The lost will be found. Strength is in weakness. The greatest of you will be the least. Jesus here is literally leveling the playing field. That is why Luke has Jesus speaking these words, not like Matthew's version of the Beatitudes in the context of a Sermon on the Mount. Luke's version, we see in verse 17, says that Jesus came down with the twelve apostles and stood on a level place. Jesus is meeting the people where they live, speaking with them face to face, eye to eye, on the same level. So for Jesus, princes, paupers, presidents, peons, and prima donnas are all on the same level. In the eyes of Jesus, there are no favorites, no first class or second class, and everyone in the hierarchy of God's kingdom is equally in need of a Savior, equally dependent on God's grace. As it says in our collect, and because in our weakness we can do nothing good without you, give us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commandments, we may please you both in will and in deed. Is this good news? I believe it is. And so do you. How do I know this? I can see the truth of this gift of grace living in you here at St. Mark's because of the fruits of your labor, your own first fruits of Jesus' gospel promise. 
you all have been engaged in a series of efforts as a congregation to address the concern that among America's largest city, cities, Charlotte ranks dead last in terms of upward mobility. One in five children lives in poverty. That's about, about 50,000 children in the greater Charlotte area. In response, you have developed a partnership with the Ransom Middle School, a school that has a significantly impoverished population as part of its student body. And more recently, you've entered into a conversation with them about race and racial reconciliation. You also established the preschool La Escuelita San Marcos five years ago. And now you are in the early stages of initiating a new effort to help local women to transition into the workplace by giving them culinary training and teaching employment skills. This is the gospel promise alive and well here and now. These are all expressions of the kingdom that Jesus envisioned and initiated. These are all incarnations of what we have come to call the Jesus movement, disciples making a difference. This is what beloved community looks like. Today I give thanks for your witness in Huntersville that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the playing field is being leveled. And today we welcome and confirm prior justice, a new member of God's family, a new apostle to share in this work. And you know, in the biblical tradition, when someone commits their life to God and to Jesus, there's sometimes a change in name, like Saul becoming Paul. But for you, there's no need to change your name, because your name says it all. It says what we are celebrating today, prior justice. Justice comes first in God's kingdom. Today we are showing what it means to love God, love your neighbor, change the world. This is good news. You are good news. Remember the words of Jeremiah. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out roots by the stream. Today you are that tree. You are the gospel promise. You are an incarnation of Christ's beloved community in our 